Hello friends, this is Britt and welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today we'll be talking about the four books that I finished in September as well as completing my reading journal spreads. If you see any materials that you're interested in, they'll be linked in the description box as well as links to all the books that we talk about. As usual, I will be doing all my book reviews in the voiceover and in the visual you'll be able to see me working on my journal spreads. My September theme was mushrooms, so if you'd like to see the video of me setting this up and doing all these mushroom illustrations, I will also link that in the card and in the description. So let's get into our first review. In Defense of Witches, The Legacy of the Witch Hunts and Why Women Are Still on Trial by Mona Cholet. How is the legacy of the witch hunts still affecting us today? This is the question the author is addressing in this nonfiction book. Mona Cholet uses the witch as a stand-in for women across history and explores how the misogyny that fueled the murder of so many women is still manifesting in oppression in modern times. The stories of individual women from history are woven in with more broad concepts and social issues, including marriage, motherhood, women's careers, and more. Particularly, the book explores how society punishes women who step outside their expected roles and behaviors, and how this continues to happen now, and also how societal shaming is used to silence women who attempt to speak out against injustices. Something I learned was that during the European witch hunts, there were villages where nearly every woman was executed, effectively wiping out entire family lines. The author does a great job interconnecting all of these concepts and tidbits of history into a really good overview of women's changing roles in society. However, even though there are a lot of very serious topics, the book flows nicely and is easy to read. It does not feel like you're reading a textbook. I think that this would be a great starting place for those who are starting to delve into these topics since it gives a nice broad overview. For me, since I've read a lot of nonfiction regarding feminism and patriarchy, there wasn't as much new information there for me. When I went into it, I was expecting the book to go into deeper detail about witchcraft and the witch trials. While the book does mention these topics quite a bit, it's more about the connection to modern life, and so it didn't quite meet the expectations that I had going into it, which isn't the book's fault. This was a really well-written primer in the history of women's oppression, and I would recommend it for anyone who's interested in these topics and is looking for a good place to dip their toes in. The Department of Truth, The Complete Conspiracy Deluxe Hardcover, Volume 1, by James Tynan IV. Read this if you're looking for a horror graphic novel with gorgeous and disturbing art, Conspiracy theories that physically manifest if enough people believe in them. Lots of cryptids and the creepy bowels of the Denver airport. And heavy commentary on American culture and society. This is a bind-up of the first 17 issues of the horror graphic novel series The Department of Truth. This has a really fun concept. The author is playing with the Buddhist idea of a tulpa, which is a materialized being or thought form, typically in human form, that is created through spiritual practice and intense concentration. In this universe, conspiracy theories can be manifested, if enough people believe in them. In response to this, the US government has established the Department of Truth in order to search out these manifestations and eliminate them. This opens up a lot of interesting avenues for the story to follow, including a lot of the cryptids and conspiracy theories of the last 50 years, such as Mothman, Bigfoot, Flat Earth, Satanic Panic, and weird happenings at the Denver airport. I love the art style in this volume. Some of it looks almost like collage art, incorporating parts of old photographs of famous people and newsprint in a very graphic and abstract way. Other parts are more like paintings, with broad brush strokes and a lot of movement. It has so much visual interest, I could look at the illustrations all day. The artists did an amazing job. I'm a very visual person, so this really appealed to me. While I really enjoyed the concept and the possibilities of where the story could be going, there were some parts I felt 
that bog the story down. There is a main story arc where the department members are trying to figure out who or what is causing these tulpas to occur, which I was very interested in. There are also these side quests where the main characters have to go hunt Bigfoot or Mothman or other cryptids or smaller conspiracies. Some of those lasted a little bit too long for me and kept us away from the main story for longer than I wanted. But this could be due to the fact that this is released in issues as a comic book, so the story structure and pacing is going to be different than with a novel. Overall, I had a really good time with it, and if you enjoy horror or conspiracy theories, you'll definitely enjoy this too. And the story isn't finished yet, so there's more to look forward to in the future. Private Rights by Julia Armfield Read this if you're looking for a queer retelling of King Lear at the end of the world. Gorgeous and emotional writing that leaves you feeling unsettled. Complicated and relatable family interactions between sisters. Uncanny apocalyptic Ballardian vibes. And a house that feels alive that also has an eerie past. This was one of my most anticipated books of 2024, and it didn't disappoint. We're following three sisters during a slow apocalypse shortly after their father has passed away. It's a very loose retelling of King Lear. Our main characters live in a near-future England where it constantly rains and the land is flooded. In this climate disaster, everyone goes about their daily business, commuting by boat or elevated train, grinding along as the world goes to pieces. This story has the exact feeling that I look for, a strangely uncanny and uncomfortable feeling. I think the best word to describe this book is haunting. Paul Tremblay described it as Ballardian, and I would also agree with that assertion. While the book is set during the backdrop of a climate disaster, it is really about family relationships. All three sisters had a difficult relationship with their emotionally unavailable father, and also have very complicated relationships with each other. The story is told from all three sisters' points of view, and a fourth point of view from the city itself. Interestingly, their childhood home also seems like another character in the story. Their father was a famous architect who designed the home to be able to adapt to the coming disaster. The house can automatically raise itself on stilts to respond to rising floodwaters, lending an ominous sense of life to it as it creaks and moves. The sisters also have a mysterious past with their mother's disappearance still looming and strange half-memories of dark occurrences in the house. The interplay of relationships between the sisters was very relatable and realistic with a combination of love, insecurity, annoyance, and even disgust with each other at times. There is also great queer representation and some interesting relationships with the sisters and their partners. As the story unfolds, the sisters must come together at their father's house to face their unmoored and confusing sense of grief for a man that they couldn't fully know. Like Armfield's previous novel, this book is a slow, delectable burn. It's heavy on vibes and snippets of vignettes. While there is a plot, I would say that it's much heavier on feelings and symbolism. I enjoyed this one even more than Our Wives Under the Sea, and I kept thinking about it after I finished it. I highly recommend this for anyone who enjoys slightly unsettling literary fiction that has a slower pace. A quote from Private Rights. People think it's just hellfire and brimstone, four horsemen and out, but actually the end times go on and on and on. The Electric State by Simon Stallenhog. Read this if you're looking for a dystopian sci-fi art book plus a novella length story. A young woman and a robot traveling across the post-apocalyptic California desert of the 1990s the most beautiful illustrations that evoke feelings of nostalgia and unease, visuals that you want to climb inside of, and that Twin Peaks feeling. This book is a little different than what I usually pick up, and I thoroughly enjoyed the experience. The Electric State is like an art book with a novella-length story added in to the breathtaking illustrations. 
The story follows Michelle, a young woman who's traveling with a cute robot named Skip through the dystopian wastelands of the California desert. It's set in the 1990s, but in this world, it seems that some sort of apocalyptic war has occurred with abandoned hulking war machines littering the landscape. Seemingly, a Neuralink device was invented to aid in warfare so that pilots could better control drones, but it is now literally the opiate of the masses, with people's physical bodies withering away as they stay longer and longer in the virtual world. Michelle and Skip are traveling through this ruined landscape on the search for her little brother, who is also being sought by a mysterious government agent. The art in this book is drop-dead gorgeous. The illustrations are haunting yet nostalgic and comforting somehow. They manage to be futuristic and retro at the same time. I just want to climb inside of them. I've been following the art of Simon Stallenhog for many years now, but this is the first time I've had a chance to read one of his books, and it was a sheer delight for me. Not only is the art style right up my alley, but I also love the type of stories Stallenhog tells, which are self-described as kitchen sink sci-fi. This book is a haunting vision of a past future that I want to linger in as long as possible, feeling the eerie and beautiful atmosphere. The feelings and art style are reminiscent of Twin Peaks or The X-Files. As an added bonus, it's a quick read, taking me only about an hour, although I wanted more when I got to the end. This book will definitely appeal to those who enjoy nostalgic sci-fi and gorgeous dystopian landscapes. And if you do pick it up, I recommend listening to the companion album also created by Stallenhog while you're reading it to get the full immersive experience. And that wraps things up for my September reading. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you had a good time, don't forget to like and subscribe and click that notification bell so that you'll always be informed when I post more book reviews. I hope you'll join me next week for the video of my November reading journal setup. And I've also been participating in Inktober, which is a month-long drawing challenge where you need to do a sketch or a drawing every day related to a prompt. And I've been uploading those on Instagram and also here on YouTube as shorts. So I'll link the playlist for that in the description box and up in the card if you'd like to check that out. And you can find more art and book reviews on my website, bibliocreep.com or on Instagram. My handle is at biblio underscore creep. As we get closer to the chaos of the end of the year, remember, please, to take care of yourself. Give yourself a little break when you need to. Drink your water, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.